You're listening to Beyond Wellness Radio, bringing you the cutting edge in health, nutrition, and sports performance. Stay up to date and listen anywhere, anytime on your computer, tablet, or smartphone by subscribing on iTunes. Catch your hosts, Dr. Justin Marchegiani and Barris Harvey, as they answer your burning health questions, as well as interviews from world-renowned guest experts. For more Beyond Wellness Radio, go to beyondwellnessradio.com. Hey there, it's Dr. Justin Marcajani, and welcome back to Beyond Wellness Radio. Today I have a treat for all of our listeners. Today we have Scott Forsgren, otherwise known as the Better Health Guy. And I'm pretty sure Scott's site is betterhealthguy.com. Is that correct, Scott? <laughs> That's right, Dr. Justin. All right, great. So Scott is, I would consider, one of the most premier experts on Lyme disease as well as co-infections that coordinate or kind of come with Lyme disease. And Scott's going to break down some of these different conditions, what to look out for, testing, supplements. Scott's been dealing with his own Lyme slash co-infection issues for almost 20 years. So he's really researched it, seen some of the best doctors in the world, gotten the best treatment. He knows what's worked for him, what's worked for the patients that he sees now. And I think he can provide just a really excellent perspective that most other people maybe have never heard before. So Scott, welcome to the show. Thanks so much, Dr. Justin. Good to be here. Awesome. So Scott, can you just share your story with all of our listeners? It's very unique. Um, you dealt with Lyme's almost 20 years ago and you kind of dealt, jumped right into the trenches, saw lots of practitioners, did lots of things. Can you outline your story for everyone? Sure. So my story started in Northern California in 1996, where I had a tick bite in Sea Ranch, California. And of course, Lyme disease at the time, everyone thought doesn't exist in California, and so no one really thought anything about it. Uh, and then in 1997, everything pretty much fell apart. It started off in, the, in one weekend where it felt like a, a really significant flu. I had burning sensations throughout my entire body. Um, and those symptoms just continued to get worse and worse. Um, some of the most significant ones being some of the neurological symptoms like burning sensations from head to toe that lasted 24 hours a day, um, a fever that went on for over a year, uh, muscle pain, joint pain, digestive problems. I mean, there's, there's a huge list of things that can be associated with Lyme disease. And I would say that I experienced uh, probably the majority of them. Um, and it took about eight years before the first first person ever mentioned Lyme disease as a possibility. So I was pretty much bedridden for the first four years. I would say I probably spent 12 to 16 hours a day in bed during the first four years. Wow. I, I then had a reasonable period of what I thought was being back to a fairly good stable place, um, not knowing then that it was in fact Lyme disease. And so from about 2000 to 2004, things weren't perfect, but they they were certainly pretty good. I was functioning well, working full time, doing all of those things. And then in 2004, um, pretty much overnight, the symptoms came back on again uh, with the burning sensations. And I would say that the second time around was as bad as the first. Fortunately, uh, I kind of hit the reset button and, and found some new doctors. They really had no idea. And at this point, this was already probably 50 doctors, you know, neurologists and uh, every other specialty that I had been to, uh, folks at some of the best medical institutions that really had no idea what what might be wrong other than you know being a psychosomatic stress induced kind of illness which i knew that right. it wasn't but you know after so many people tell you that's what it is you do kind of question yourself and, and wonder you know are you really creating all these things which you know i i didn't think that i was uh and so in 2005 someone finally suggested that I uh, work with a practitioner that does a form of energetic testing called electroacupuncture according to Vol or electrodermal screening, which is not really a conventional tool, but it is a, a tool that can give people some insight. I know you're familiar with various forms of kinesiology. Mm. Um, and so that person was kind of tasked with identifying the foods that were triggering my symptoms and then I was supposed to avoid all of those foods and that was supposed to be the fix uh, and and fortunately uh, that person who at the time worked in an outlet mall next to a Starbucks coffee shop and had this computer that made all kinds of interesting noises for an hour was the first person that said I think you should really go back and have your doctor test you for Borrelia which is the main uh, causative agent in Lyme disease for Babesia for Bartonella and for Ehrlichia and those 
or three of the uh, co-infections that can come with Lyme disease. There are certainly others. Um, and so I, I kind of walked out of that uh, session with that practitioner thinking, you know, this is a little bit odd. I, I wasn't really rushing back to the doctor because I wasn't sure that I believed what they had come up with. And, and so she kept kind of urging me, you really need to go get tested. So I went back and we did uh, a round of Igenix testing and some other testing. Mm -hmm. And it definitely uh, revealed some of the things that she had found. And then as we retested over the course of the next six to 12 months, um, we ended up having a positive tests for the co-infections and um, indications for Borrelia as well. So uh, it, it was it was really interesting. At that time, the doctor that I was working with said, you know, it's interesting because I do treat a lot of people with Lyme and you have a lot of the symptoms of Lyme and I'm not sure why I, I, I didn't connect the dots, uh, you know, at that point in time. But um, fortunately, this lady who had a very unique kind of uh, off the beaten path way of evaluating the stressors in the body was the first one that mentioned Lyme disease. And then, you know, I went many other places after that to try to find, uh, you know, treatment and such. But it was, uh, you know, it's definitely something that took me in my prime, you know, right, uh, you know, a couple of years after I had gotten out of college and was just starting into my career and mm -hmm. had never really had any significant health problems and, uh, you know, completely knocks you down to the point that, um, you know, you're not really sure if you will survive it or can continue, you know, struggling through the pain of the disease uh, for, mm -hmm. for another day. So it, it definitely uh, takes you to your lowest, darkest place. And then the challenge mm -hmm. and the, the beauty is trying to find your way back and, and reinventing yourself and coming back with a different perspective about the world. So regarding your health at the time, you were like, what, 21, 22? Uh, gosh, when it started, I was 25. 25 and how was your health then like were you eating well were you sleeping well were you managing stress in your life how was your overall health well it's an interesting question because i would say that the majority of people that i connect with that are dealing with lyme were type a plus personalities <laughs> <laughs> so it's it's pretty rare that you find a person with Lyme that was a really chill kind of relaxed uh, mm -hmm. you know character. So um, no, I I had a lot of you know type A. It's not even tendencies. I mean that that's really an understatement. Mm -hmm. I definitely was type A. I was always the you know the A student. I had lots of emotional stress growing up as a child. Right. Um, I I had a number of things that kind of set the stage for you know adrenal challenges that then affect my immune system along with the stress and so on. So, you know, looking back, while I hadn't yet hit the point that the scale was kind of tipped and everything fell apart, there certainly th were things that set the stage. And I think, you know, the emotional backdrop of a person's life is a huge, huge part of any of these chronic illnesses. And then something that you have to dig really deep to explore and, you know, make sure that you get to a point that you feel that you really do deserve to be well. And, you know, that was a big challenge for me. I had, um, you know, learn to do some of my own muscle testing at that point, and I would, uh, you know, muscle test for I'm willing to be well, and I would get yes, and I'm able to be well, and I would get yes, and then, you know, I would say I deserve to be well, and I would get no, and I'm like, God, I'm testing myself, <laughs> I'm getting no, that's pretty bad, so... Right. Uh, you know, there was a lot of, I probably worked with a good dozen practitioners just on the emotional front. You know, mm -hmm. what is it that I, you know, have internalized that maybe isn't supporting my health? Um, you know, what are the stressors that I'm putting upon myself that, that are kind of creating that? The, the other thing that we just in the last couple of years um, identified that I think also set the stage for this was I had had my wisdom teeth removed mm -hmm. in high school and I had developed a dry socket in high school. And of course, all they did was, you know, pack it with a bunch of antibiotic gauze and those kinds of things and never thought anything about it again and uh, two years ago I was working with a practitioner in St. Louis who's just absolutely phenomenal, fantastic, Dr. Simon Yu, and he, uh, he, he's written a book called Accidental Cure for those that are interested in, you know, trying to uh, help get their way back from, from mysterious type conditions. Um, and he was uh, the person who suggested that there were some cavitations or some, you know, infected areas where those wisdom teeth had been removed. And that was another important piece for me to address as well. And so, you know, kind of tying that back into your question, I think it was uh, another thing that happened early in my life that there, there was this chronic infection that was already there from the wisdom tooth extraction back in high school that probably had 
it already kind of weakened my immune system's ability to maintain balance. And then once the Lyme came along, combined with all the other stressors of having just moved from, at the time I was uh, living in Texas and, and having moved from Texas to California and being here in Silicon Valley in a very high stress kind of environment in a new mm-hmm. career and, you know, working really hard and all those things, um, you know, drinking 10 free Diet Cokes a day that the office provides oh, for yeah. you so you can be caffeined up and working hard and exactly. you know, all that kind of stuff. So, um, you know, I was aware of, you know, uh, alternative and integrative health and, and was doing, and I was already on supplements and things back then. But, you know, no, I, I think though my health felt relatively good. I mean, I definitely had signs that things were not perfect. I had uh, tremendous problems with headaches um, during high school and college, and, and that was a major focus. I had periods where I had, uh, mm-hmm. you know, probably stress-related, but periods where I had, had you know, there's some blood pressure related problems and things along those lines. So I, I think it's probably unlikely that someone gets exposed to Lyme and was completely 100% healthy and vital before and then has a really significant uh, challenge with it. I'm not saying it doesn't happen. Right. I think when you look back, there's usually some, you know, some Stressor. things that set the right. stage. Or if you look in people's families, you know, you look at their mom's health or their sibling's health and they have you know, multiple autoimmune type conditions or things yeah. where the you know, the, the immune system didn't respond to some microbe or toxin or something in an appropriate way. I think you can kind of see that, uh, you know, it, it may seem like a big surprise, but when you really look a little deeper and someone like you, who I, I know is amazing with pulling out all these great functional medicine uh, pieces of information, I, I know you're probably connecting the dots for people all the time. So. Right, right. And I appreciate you sharing that story. And there was an interesting article that came out about 20 years ago in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition. And the title of the article was The Synergism Between Nutrition, Infection, and Immunity. And again, it looked at all of these nutritional deficiencies, stress, kind of setting the table up for these chronic infections. So we're kind of like in two places. You can be the person that's not infected yet, but can make a lot of these changes to make themselves more resistant. And then we have the person that's already infected. They're dealing with this infection. They have some of these symptoms. Can you just talk about, there's a couple of main co-infections. We have Bartonella, we have Borrelia Borrelia or Lyme's, we have Ehrlichia. Can you just go through those big four or five co-infections, Scott, and then just what are some of the, what are some of the big uh, few inf- symptoms that are going to be correlated with each infection? Okay, yeah, that's a good question. So I think, um, you know, in order to talk about Lyme at all, we really kind of have to dig into the co-infections that I would suggest almost universally come with it. I think if you talk to um, doctors and practitioners that work with Lyme disease, it is a rare, rare person that has Borrelia alone. Right. Um, I would say it's almost universal that people have Babesia and Bartonella as well. They may or may not have both of them. Um, But when someone is bitten by a tick or other vector, ticks may not be the only vector for Lyme disease, though that is the focus and the one that really has been uh, proven as a way of transmitting these infections. Um, there's generally multiple infections that a person could be exposed to. So um, the first one, Borrelia burgdorferi, is the causative agent in Lyme. That's the spirochete right. that everybody talks about. And then we have other ones, probably the most common ones, Babesia, Bartonella, and Ehrlichia. Um, I would say Ehrlichia is a little less common than Babesia and Bartonella in in my experience. Um, I had all of them. Um, And then there are others that are not quite as commonly discussed, but things like parvovirus B19, Mm -hmm. tick-borne encephalitis virus, um, coxiella or Q fever, tularemia. There's all kinds of mycoplasmas and nematodes and other things that these ticks can carry as well. Right. And just and to be beyond. clear, just to yeah. be clear, um, Ehrlichia, Rocky Mountain spotted fever, and anaplasmosis are all the same, right? Well, there everything used to be called Ehrlichia, and then it was kind of split out. So Ehrlichia and anaplasma are very similar, and then Rocky Mountain spotted fever is one of the rickettsial organisms, um, but they are similar. Okay. Um, and then beyond the co-infections, of course, then you kind of get into all the things that people 
already carried in their bodies, you know, the Epstein bars and other uh, more opportunistic things. And so those are something that we have to think about as well. But if, if we look at kind of the, the core microbes involved in Lyme, and, you know, I'm always a little cautious because I think people with Lyme tend to hyper focus on Lyme. It's almost even a bad term because it, it gives us license to ignore all of the other things that we yes. need to look at to get better. And it gives practitioners license to continue treating those you know few things when maybe they do need adrenal support or thyroid support or hormone support or a better diet or they're living in a moldy home and I mean we'll probably get into some of those things but kind of back to your question so Borrelia the things that often come up are things like joint pain stiffness um, swelling, fevers, chills, um, some gastrointestinal issues, vision issues like blurry vision, um, twitching is a common one, so fasciculations where you just kind of mm. feel little taps in the muscles. I mean, that's a, that's a very common thing and can be related to uh, Bartonella as well. Um, Borrelia can be depression, memory issues, um, fatigue is a really common one in people that have these kinds of vector-borne, um, you know, Lyme complex issues. It can certainly affect your sleep. Um, it can create headaches and ringing in the ears. Uh, neck and upper back pain is a common thing. Uh, tremors, some uh, more mental emotional things like anxiety, depression, um, light sensitivity. And then once it gets into the central nervous system, which really does not take a, a long time for that to happen, then you get some of the other numbness, tingling, crawling sensations, burning sensations. I mean, the burning sensations was probably my worst, where you went for, you know, years with what felt like someone having poured acid on your skin 24 hours a day and I mean I had a whole summer where I couldn't even put on a shoe or a sock because it, wow. it just was so painful um, and then you know the, the the list of Borrelia if you look I think there's over 300 symptoms um, and they kind of scroll through that there's a, a couple of films now documentaries on Lyme called Under Our Skin and then yeah. they just came out with the follow-up which is called Emergence and uh, for people who really want to learn more about Lyme I think those are great films they can be they can be a little frightening if someone's just getting diagnosed with Lyme, but I think it's better now that there's the follow-up movie where you can see that you know the, the same people in the first movie really have uh, found better states of health and wellness. Um, because the first movie is it, it is quite frightening when you see how impacted uh, these people are, especially one of the the, the main kind of um, person in the documentary, Mandy. I mean, she was she was really really impaired with uh, Lyme, and today. Right. Uh, is doing incredibly well, is working in a hospital as a, as a nurse, and, uh, you know, really, I think it changed her life, and now she's, she's giving back. But um, Bartonella is another one that, quite honestly, I think, yes, Borrelia probably sets the stage for a lot of these things to be more persistent and more chronic. But if you look at the symptoms, I would say Bartonella and Babesia are the ones that really probably create more of the symptoms that people really struggle with. Um, Bartonella, things like anxiety, depression, bipolar disorder. Um, we, we actually call it Bartonella rage because people that right. are the nicest, I mean, I've worked with some people that were, you know, uh, teenage uh, uh, ladies, girls that um, just seem so nice. And yet, you know, their families would talk about how, you know, they might be like that one minute and then the next minute they're throwing things at them and breaking things and, you know, breaking dishes and glasses and, you know, all kinds of things. And, you know, it, it really is just that there's a lot of these uh, microbial issues that can affect behavior as well. I mean, obsessive compulsive disorder can be tied in with Bartonella. Um, I tend to be a little bit on the obsessive compulsive side, which I know you already know. <laughs> uh, but that, that, that can play a role. And then uh, Bartonella also can affect uh, the gastrointestinal system. So lots of gastrointestinal issues. Um, it's very common that people with Bartonella will wake up and say that they're um, the soles of their feet are, mm -hmm. are hurting and that that kind of improves throughout the day. Um, you can actually get what looks like stretch marks, but it doesn't necessarily go along the same skin planes that you would expect to see with the normal stretch marks. So they're mm -hmm. called striae. Um, mm -hmm. Twitching, again, with Bartonella, very common. Light sensitivity. Um, swollen lymph nodes. It definitely has an affinity for the lymphatic system. Um, 
uh, nodules under the skin, mood swings. And the thing that's interesting about Bartonella is it's really a vascular infection that impacts the endothelium and the lining of the vessels. And so it leads to this uh, small vessel disease and creates uh, impairments in blood flow throughout the entire body. So any symptom that you could get as a result of having an impairment of blood flow and circulation to any part of the body um, potentially mm -hmm. could result from Bartonella. So I, I think Bartonella uh, maybe is is the one that is, uh, you know, creating more of the symptoms for a lot of people. And it's also probably more challenging to treat than Borrelia. At least that's been my observation. Um, Babesia is another big one. That one creates... Uh, let me, let me step back on Babesia, a little bit different. So Borrelia is, is spirochete, kind of mm -hmm. a bacteria. Bartonella is a bacteria. Babesia is actually a parasite, and so it lives in the red blood cell, and it's kind of a cousin of malaria, mm -hmm. and it creates things like headaches, um, night sweats, or day sweats. So you'll talk to people that, you know, they're they're literally drenched at night while they're sleeping, and they had to get up and change their, their you know, night clothes or their sheets or whatever several times just because the night sweats are, are so significant. Air hunger is a common one that you just feel like you can't get a deep enough breath. Um, sometimes people will have a, the little red dots on the skin. The cherry angiomas can be a factor in Babesia as well, though both Bartonella and Babesia can create a, a whole list of skin-specific uh, presentations. Um, Babesia can also cause ringing in the ears. A lot of people will have a cough, a really chronic dry cough that lasts for long periods of time or uh, flushing sensation you know, in the face and skin and those kinds of things. Um, Ehrlichia then, or anaplasma, I would think of things like uh, fevers, fatigue, headaches, uh, pain, and then low white blood cell count is a common one with Ehrlichia. Mm -hmm. well, that, that can be a factor in, in Lyme overall when the white blood cell count is low. That's maybe a, a reason to also think about Ehrlichia. And I think part of the challenge is, you know, when you have one of these infections and you can kind of map it to one list of symptoms, well, it, it becomes pretty easy, but that's usually not the case. Usually you have a, such a significant overlap in not only these infections, but the parasites, the viruses, the mycoplasmas, you know, uh, the, the fungal yeast, mm -hmm. candida type organisms, and so on. And so when you start kind of looking at all the overlapping list of symptoms, it's really difficult to take symptoms and lead that to a conclusion of, you know, which infection is driving it. And, and then you have the additional complexity that you look at the list of things for heavy metal toxicity, and you look at the list of things for mold toxicity, and so many of the symptoms overlap the same things that we just talked about for these vector-borne infections. So it, it's, exactly. it's, it's really hard to differentiate just by, you know, the symptoms. Exactly. So there's a lot of different questions here we can ask based on each of these. We're going to have to definitely have you back for a part two because I know we're going to really want to get in deep on this. I know this is a huge epidemic. And based on that, can you just talk about how common these issues are? I mean, we talk about Lyme disease and you hear people at the CDC or your conventional MD saying, well, that's not endemic here. That's only in maybe the upper northeast in, in Lyme, Connecticut area or, or some area in and around there. Can you talk about how common these infections are and then where in the country we, we may find these? You know, I think you can find them pretty much in every state at this point. I read something recently that said that uh, there, there have been people in all 50 states that have been impacted by Lyme. There certainly are people that would question whether or not they contracted it in those states or, you know, they they maybe got it somewhere else, traveled to Nantucket or, you know, somewhere back east and just happened to be back in those states. But, you know, I know people um, that had very, very difficult decade plus long journeys with Lyme that were infected in Hawaii. And most people don't think of Hawaii as a place right. that you would get Lyme. Um, most people don't think of California as a place that you could get Lyme. And in fact, northern in California specifically is one of the areas that has a very significant uh, number of people dealing with Lyme. It's not just the, the East anymore. Um, it's not just the United States. I mean, if I look at, uh, you know, all the people that kind of track what I'm posting and stuff on, on my Facebook page, there's many, many different countries, lots of European countries. Um, I've talked to people in Brazil. It's a very common problem in, in people in Brazil as well. And I think the 
the number of people that know that they have Lyme, in fact, the CDC revised their, their uh, estimates not too long ago, suggesting that it was probably 10 times more than what it had been in the past. And I believe they had suggested now up to 300,000 cases a year, which I think uh, many people um, that are treating people with Lyme would, would probably suggest that that's probably underestimated. Um, and if you mm -hmm. then look at, um, you know, people with other conditions that I, I, I'm not one to suggest that things like MS and Parkinson's and ALS and all those are Lyme disease, but I, I would suggest that those are conditions that have a component of infection, a component mm -hmm. of toxicity, and a component of, you know, everything else that Lyme has. And if you look, um, many of these people with multiple sclerosis and Parkinson's and ALS and neurodegenerative, you know, conditions, even Alzheimer's, um, Lyme may have been a factor. And so the question is, how many people maybe have had Lyme that never got diagnosed and they live with it as a stressor that their body largely balances and is able to maintain some sort of a state of health for years and years. And as they get older, maybe they have another one of these conditions and then they get tested for Lyme. And in fact, they also had Lyme. Now, whether Lyme was the driving factor or not, it's it's difficult to say. And probably, you know, in all of those cases, it's probably not. It's probably a host of things. But fibromyalgia and chronic fatigue as well. I mean, I've known so many people. In fact, before my Lyme diagnosis, I was diagnosed with fibromyalgia and I was diagnosed with chronic fatigue syndrome. And while there are some unique presentations in those illnesses, um, there's also a lot of overlap in that uh, infections are common, toxicity is common. Uh, and if you, you know, I, I know a number of people that really identified more with fibromyalgia and chronic fatigue in the past. They got tested for Lyme. They got tested for co-infection. Sure enough, they had Lyme, they had co-infections. Doesn't mean that, uh, you know, that Lyme is their sole issue. But unfortunately, I think what's kind of happened is a lot of these things have become labels and they're just slightly different variations mm -hmm. of labels that represent some combination of bugs and some combination of toxins and some probably epigenetic and genetic factors that um, are involved in your immune system's response to how the body reacts to these things. But mm -hmm. um, I do think that there's a number of people out there where Lyme is one of the stressors that their body is dealing with and the co-infections as well that don't even know about it. Um, there's been some research done by Judy McClossey uh, and also separately some research that was done by Alan McDonald, who is one of my heroes and I've met several times and, and just an amazing what he's done for uh, research around Lyme disease. And they have both talked about finding the DNA of spirochetes in the brains of people with Alzheimer's. And those, right. in some cases, maybe Lyme, and in some cases, maybe other spirochetes like uh, Treponema denticola, which is a, a fairly common dental spirochete. Mm -hmm. But, you know, a, a lot of these conditions that are neurological, um, I think more and more we will find that, you know, infections and toxicity play a huge role. So, um, mm -hmm. and it's interesting too, I think it's still highly debated in terms of, um, you know, the Infectious Disease Society of America has one perspective on Lyme, which is that it's difficult to get and easy to cure. And the ILADS or International Lyme and Associated Diseases Society has a different perspective, which is that it's relatively easy to get and relatively difficult to um, cure, especially after some period of time where it's really not in that acute stage anymore. Um, and I think that there is a lot more awareness around Lyme disease now. We're seeing um, more and more discussion about it in the media. When I first uh, got sick, uh, you know, Google didn't even exist. There were very few online support groups like there are now. Exactly. There was very little talk about Lyme disease. Um, I I don't even know if there was an ILADS yet or a LymeDisease.org. I'm not sure when they came into the picture. They've both been around for quite a while and do some amazing work. But um, the uh, awareness about the disease is certainly uh, increasing. And I think even more recently where we see, you know, celebrities that are finally starting to speak out. You know, there's a number of them that for years there's been talk about certain celebrities celebrities having uh, potentially had Lyme disease. Uh, there's been talk about, you know, Alec Baldwin as one potentially. There's been talk about Richard Gere. I mean, there's been talk a, a lot over the years of people that Lyme may have been an issue for them. But now we know uh, Yolanda.
Wanda Foster, who yep. is, uh, you know, married to David Geffen and one of the uh, real housewives of Beverly Hills. I mean, she's had a tremendously difficult uh, journey through yep. Lyme, and I think she's probably, as a result of her journey, going to make some very significant changes because she's really, you know, she has the resources to go out and really explore a number of different types of treatment options, and, you know, hopefully as a result of that, some things will come out of it that will make things easier um, for people that are dealing with Lyme in terms of accessing treatment. Um, Avril Lavigne just yeah, came out. I just out saw that on your week. Facebook. Yeah, Avril Lavigne. I saw that yeah. one too. So apparently she had struggled with it, I think, for almost a year. I believe it was last April that she started getting sick. And, you know, no one, none of her fans or anything really had any idea of, you know, she had pretty much just completely gone off the scene and no one was really clear what was wrong with her. And so she just finally uh, came out. There was a good article, I believe it was, yeah, People Magazine, um, talking about her story and, uh, you know, it sounds like she's getting back to a better place. Debbie Gibson was another one last year who, uh, you know, singer as well, who uh, had a very significant uh, journey with Lyme. And so I think there is more awareness. There certainly is still somewhat of a political divide in terms of, you know, how to approach treatment. Some people suggest that if you uh, do antibiotic therapy for 28 days and you are not well, that what you have is something called post Lyme disease syndrome, which means you don't have infection anymore. And we don't know why you have symptoms. But you know, we kind of gave it our best shot versus someone who would suggest that there's many, many uh, studies that show persistence of infection in animal models and others that have been treated for long periods of time with antibiotics, and that these bugs are still there. Um, and so that kind of uh, group of people would suggest that longer term treatment um, is is beneficial and that people do continue to improve with uh, antibiotic and other treatment. When I first got uh, ill and well actually when I first got diagnosed which was eight years into having been ill uh, so 2005 that there was not a lot out there in terms of treating Lyme disease. Mm -hmm. the, the option then was antibiotics antibiotics or antibiotics you pick which one you want right that was kind of the that was kind of what I what I had. Um, we did not then have uh, Stephen Buhner just came out with mm -hmm. his first book, Healing Lyme, in 2005, the year that I got diagnosed. There was um, just the very beginnings of something called the Cowden Protocol from mm -hmm. Nutramedics. I think Cemento existed around 2003. Right. We didn't have Beyond Balance formulas. We didn't have Byron White formulas. I mean, we didn't have any of these tools that we have now. And so while I definitely see people that work with their doctors and do need antibiotics, there are certainly some people that the natural herbal integrative options just don't seem to be enough uh, to manage their symptoms. Um, I would have done things a little bit differently now, which is maybe I would have still done antibiotics because I did get some pretty significant symptom relief, especially in those neurological burning sensations within the first six to nine months. They pretty much resolved. Um, so I, I may still have done some antibiotics, but now there's so many options out there. And I think especially for people that, you know, are, are not quite as deep in the hole as I was when I first started getting treatment. I mean, if they're relatively functional, I think there's so many options out there now, integrative, alternative, herbal type, homeopathic type options. And, you know, I know you're familiar with a lot of these things. And I think mm -hmm. the beauty of those things is you can move things forward, but you aren't necessarily having some of the same collateral damage, right? So once you've done, you know, one of the challenges for me even to this day is, is being really cautious and careful about diet, doing all the right things to continue to support the gut and so on, because after you've been on antibiotics for three and a half years for every day, uh, you know, you can only imagine that your gut flora is probably not in the best shape. Exactly. So, um, so on that note, I, I want to shift the, the conversation just sure. a little bit to some of these options here. And even before that, we kind of have like the classical conventional diagnosis from the CDC, you know, five IgG bands, three, is it two or three IgM bands? And then we have this kind of alternative diagnosis. And then we have people that aren't even coming up positive on testing. Yeah. And we're maybe using a more energetic test like Dr. Klinghart's ART or a right. muscle testing type of energetic technique to diagnose these things or even just symptoms. Can you just briefly just compare conventional versus the alternative testing versus uh, energetic testing? 
Yeah, so I think for, I, I think conventional testing is certainly important and appropriate. So I would not suggest that somebody, you know, um, avoid doing some of that more conventional testing because I think it is important for many people to see, you know, on paper that, oh yes, look, I do have some really significant issues here that I need to deal with. Um, so doing the, you know, Igenix Western blot, I think is, mm -hmm. a, is a very good thing to consider um, doing their panels for co-infection testing, I think is a great thing. Um, to your point about, you know, the criteria being a little bit different, um, Igenix looks at some bands that the CDC does not, so 31 and 34 specifically, that are Got not it. part of the uh, standard conventional Western blot anymore because they were used as part of vaccine development for the Lyme Rix vaccine, which was taken off the market over 10 years ago now because it created problems for some people. Um, and so that's unfortunate because that is two of the outer surface proteins of the Borrelia spirochete. And, you know, most labs that do Western blot testing don't look at those or don't report them. And so, you know, you're missing some, some really key information. Um, the other challenge is, uh, as you pointed out, the criteria for CDC positivity is, is quite high, meaning five IgG and I believe two IgM. Uh, but there are bands that can be indeterminate, meaning they saw something. And if those bands where they saw something were Borrelia specific bands, meaning there's nothing else that's known to cause those specific bands to appear in the test, then it's kind of like being a little bit pregnant, right? I mean, how does, you know, you can't be a little bit pregnant. So I think when those tests come back and there's some indication, yes, it's not, it's not a clear diagnosis, but Lyme disease is a clinical diagnosis by, you know, a licensed healthcare practitioner. And so, you know, oftentimes they use symptoms and the tests to kind of try to put the puzzle together. I think for uh, co-infection testing, I mentioned Igenix. I think it is good to do their co-infection mm -hmm. panel. I think right now for uh, Bartonella, there's a lab called Galaxy Diagnostics, which I think is, is worth exploring. Um, I don't think, I, I, I'm not aware of a, a real specialty lab for Babesia at this point. Um, there is Fry Laboratories as well, which I think they do some Babesia testing, but they do a number of very unique stains looking at things like biofilms and protozoan organisms, uh, which are parasites that also play a role in many people that have these chronic conditions. So I, I like Igenix, I like Fry Labs, I like Galaxy Diagnostics. Um, there's probably some others. I, I actually like the uh, Borrelia culture test from Advanced Laboratories. I know it's been attacked. A, a bit, but uh, I think they have an interesting approach. And part of the challenge with some of these tests is if your immune system is suppressed um, and you're looking at antibody type responses, uh, you may not have a positive test because the immune system is no longer able to respond or because these organisms are so stealthy and sleuthing in the body that they know how to avoid immune system recognition. And so uh, sometimes it's good to do tests that are uh, not only the antibody type testing, but also tests that are looking specifically for the organism, which are things like the advanced labs, uh, Borrelia culture test, or the um, enriched uh, uh, PCR tests that Galaxy does for Bartonella, um, those can be good. I also think that um, while CD57 is not a good tool for uh, kind of tracking improvement in my experience, and it is not specific to Borrelia, there are other things that can also cause it to be low. I think like what? When, like what? Um, some people would suggest that mold illness can cause CD57 to go lower. Some people would suggest that being in a significant Herxheimer reaction, being in a state of inflammation mm -hmm. can cause it also to go lower. Uh, some people would suggest that co-infections uh, can also cause CD57 to be lowered. Anyone I, specifically, like, like mycoplasma or anything else? Uh, I know chlamydia pneumoniae is yeah. one of them that I've heard um, some uh, lectures on that could impact CD57. So I, I think it's a good tool at the beginning to see, you know, if someone has a CD57 of 150 and you're trying to decide do they have Lyme, you know, maybe that's an indicator that, you know, you're not looking in the right place in some cases. But, mm -hmm. you know, if they have tests that are somewhat consistent, you're getting some indications that there are infections and their CD57 is 20, then, you know, they definitely have something going on that needs to be looked 
like that further. And that's uh, a marker I run a lot with my patients too, and I don't ever, you know, use it as a means of diagnosing anything. But it's interesting to run over time as you treat someone to see it go up, and that's an interesting thing seeing the immune system improve. Do you ever use that just as to run when you're treating someone to see if it's moving in the upward direction? I have not found it to be an incredibly reliable marker. And I think over time, um, some of the people that really were using it a lot um, ha have used it less over time. However, um, there are some practitioners that I know, one in particular that recently was talking about um, seeing fairly consistent increases in CD57 once she started treating parasites in her patients. Yes. And, you know, so I think there are some things, but I also know people that, um, feel fairly well, that they get to a point that they're largely symptom-free, that they're not on significant protocols anymore. They may still be on some maintenance protocols, but they feel like they've gotten their life back. And the CD57 may not necessarily represent that. Or the opposite, people that still feel miserable and are largely bedridden, and maybe they have a CD57 of 200, and you know what does that mean? So exactly, I, I think there's very little in Lyme disease that is clear, and you have to use each of these things as a piece of information and you know that's where i think you're you're really good and you know i've watched lots of your videos and things that you've put out i mean you're really putting pieces together and connecting the dots and that that's the kind of mind that it takes to deal with these chronic right. infections right it's it's right it's it's challenging <laughs> and then uh so that's kind of my thoughts on the conventional side and then you um i just want to stop you right there just just before we transition off if anyone has already run their western blot and maybe has their bands in front of them that they can look at what bands would you say are the most important like let's say they have an igg and only two bands show up or three bands show up and it wouldn't even you know be classified under a alternative criteria what bands are the most important for you that would say hey there's a problem here the ones that I would think about as being uh, fairly clear indicators for Borrelia would be 2325, which generally is reported as 1, um, 31, 34, 39, and 8393. Now, there is some talk that 31, in some cases, could have some cross-reaction with some viral, uh, some viruses mm. in the system as well. And so if that's the only one that comes up, uh, there is a confirmation test that Igenix offers where they can take it one step further and see was that positive band the result of some viral cross-reactivity or, or not. But generally speaking, those bands are the ones that, uh, uh, you know, if you look at Dr. Rich Horowitz's book, which I really at this point consider to be kind of, you know, the uh, the Bible of Lyme disease treatment. And I think that, uh, you know, anybody that is dealing with Lyme should, um, you know, get his book and, and really read it and, and digest it and work with their practitioners. It's called Why Can't I Get Better? Solving the Mystery of Lyme and Chronic disease and it's it's a fantastic book but he he talks about you know if you have any of these bands um, that it's like bingo and you know if you have one of those bands then bingo you may have Lyme disease and so um, th those are probably the ones that I would say uh, are, are worth looking at that are more Borrelia specific there's other ones like band 41 will come up in mm -hmm. almost everyone but that that's not necessarily Lyme specific that again can be tied to I think any organism that has a flagella can be a dental spiral or a host of other other bugs and so 41 is not not really a very good one generally to look at i think you have an excellent blog post on this exact topic don't you i do yeah great so definitely check that blog post it's one that i have actually saved in my library that i refer back to very good yeah. one cool and then um, i wanted to touch upon one thing here okay. for anyone that's diagnosed what's the intensity cutoff for you so if anyone's looking at their test and they're seeing the intensity are you looking at 60 and above 80 and above what's your intensity cutoff for flagging that Band. For, well, the bands are usually reported, at least on the Igenix testing, the, the bands are usually reported as indeterminate or they'll be reported as uh, one, two, three, or four pluses. And even if something is indeterminate for a band, that means they saw something, which mm -hmm. oftentimes might suggest that the immune system was having a response, but it wasn't uh, able to mount an adequate response. And so a lot of times in the Western blot, some practitioners will treat for a period of time, um, maybe a few weeks, uh, just to start uh, kind of going after some of the organisms and getting the immune system to be a little more responsive and then they might 
might repeat the Western blot, and in that case, you might have a much more clearly positive test. So um, in cases where it's suspected but the Western blot is, is not really clear, um, doing some treatment and then retesting oftentimes will then show you a different picture because the immune system starts responding to these organisms now that the treatment is killing and as it's kind of moving them through and out of the body. Um, so I think that's something to consider. You, you asked a little bit about energetic testing as well. Yes. So from my perspective, uh, energetic testing, I don't think of it as a diagnostic tool. I think of it as an informational tool, kind of a decision support system that practitioners can use um, as additional information to then go off and either run some additional conventional test or to do some empirical treatment to see if a person feels better. Um, for me, that really became my biggest guide. And I, you know, I mentioned that the very first person that ever mentioned Lyme to me was someone who did electrodermal screening. Um, and so I then started uh, mentoring with Dr. Dietrich Klinghardt up in mm -hmm. Seattle, who has really been my biggest mentor throughout this journey. I've been following his work for almost 10 years. He was my doctor for many of those years. And he has created a system of energetic testing as well called autonomic response testing, which is a more manual muscle testing uh, based system, but it's a it's a phenomenal system. The information that you can get uh, out of working with a practitioner who does you know that system or a, a similar right. system, I think, is pretty significant. Both in terms of what are the microbial stressors that are potentially impacting someone? What are the toxic stressors, metals, mm -hmm. mycotoxins, those kinds of things? Or what are some, you know, supplements or herbs that might better resonate with this person's system? And so. It's not a perfect system. Nothing, nothing in Lyme is perfect. But I, my experience has been that using energetic testing and working with skilled practitioners that know how to do energetic testing got me closer to information that really kind of guided me back to a much better state of health. And so for me, um, ultimately, the energetic testing became a more useful source of information than some of the conventional testing. But then marrying the two together was really, really helped. Beauty, right? That was fantastic. So so I do think energetic testing can be great. I think, unfortunately, not every practitioner is, um, you know, equally skilled with it. There are some practitioners that probably, uh, you know, have been doing it for decades and are phenomenal, and and maybe others that are, are not quite as skilled at it. And so, you know, finding the practitioner, I mean, if you've had an experience with energetic testing that didn't resonate with you, there's always the possibility that finding another practitioner, you know, you might have a very different experience. But um, mm -hmm. I also like some of the computer-based uh, tools like there was a, a tool that is not quite as available anymore but something called the Asira. Um, there's yeah. a tool called the Zyto that is is still a, a tool that lots of practitioners use that um, can measure somebody's uh, uh, it's through galvanic skin response or electrodermal yeah. screening can kind of measure somebody's response to something that represents a specific stressor. And so like the Zyto, there's a little kind of oversized mouse thing that somebody plugs into their computer and then you can do a scan and not only try to identify what are the potential stressors for this person, but also what are the things in terms of supplements and other, you know, anything, essentially any potential treatment that might be good to consider for, uh, you know, a particular person. Dr. Lee Cowden um, is someone who's been very, very, very uh, much uh, into using the Zyto and has has really talked and lectured about it for, for many, many years now. And so I think um, for me, energetic testing was kind of a turning point. Um, it, it, it was very, very helpful. I don't think I would have gotten to where I am now without it. And mm -hmm. while I'm generally doing very, very well and consider myself today to be a well person, you know, there are times that you still feel something is kind of not exactly right. And so I tend to now turn more to the energetic testing first to figure out, okay, what is it that I need to be doing more of or less of or, you know, shifting my diet or, or whatever. So um, I, I feel more more empowered and I think you know many patients throughout this journey um, unfortunately you kind of have to become your own advocate and your own kind of guide and align with practitioners that that can support you in that that kind of journey but uh, you know you do have to kind of get out there educate yourself make some hard choices and changes about your life and lifestyle and levels of stress and you know exposure to 
uh, electromagnetic fields and exposure to mold in your environment. I think the mold one, I mean, it's, it's such an important thing that many, many people that I've talked with over the years that were not getting well, they had Lyme, they were treating Lyme, treating Lyme, treating Lyme. They start looking into the whole mold world and the work of Richie Shoemaker, uh, survivingmold.com, and the books Mold Warriors and Surviving Mold, fantastic uh, discussions about mold. And it's surprising how many people in this country are living in an environment every day that is essentially toxic. And if they're in one of those environments, you, you can take any supplements, antibiotics, you know, do anything you want. But if you're basically in a in a bubble every day that is not healthy for you it's going to be very very difficult to recover and so right. i think most people that have these chronic conditions um even if you don't think there's mold in your house i mean it's a very very straightforward thing to at least do some initial testing um to see is it possible that i do have a mold exposure and we, we didn't really talk about it but that was part of my journey as mm -hmm. well right i mean 10 years that i was living in a place when I finally found out about the Lyme, finally came out with, uh, Richie Shoemaker came out with his book, Mold Warriors, around 2005, I believe, uh, maybe 2006, and dug into that whole issue, and sure enough, I had been living for 10 years in a place that had all all kinds of mold exposures from leaks in the roof, black mold, all these other things. And so, you know, getting out of that environment was also a big, uh, big part of recovering. It's not just about the, the line pieces, but there's so many other factors that you have to kind of add as many good things and remove as many bad things so that your body can do what it's naturally intended to do. I mean, the body is a, a beautiful, remarkable, wonderful machine, but we, we, we have to sometimes not bog it down right. with all of these stressors. Right. So let me just kind of summarize because we're going over a lot of stuff. I want to make sure people aren't overwhelmed. So we just went over some of the testing, right? We talked about the CDC type of criteria, five bands, two bands, five for the IgG, two or more for the IgM. We also talked about some of these alternative labs. We talked about uh, Galaxy. We talked about Fry Labs. We talked about Hygenics. These are great labs that have even more sensitive criteria. And then we also went over Dr. Klinghart's technique, autonomic reflex technique, and then Dr. Cowden's device, the Zyto. So a lot of different cool things that we can use to pick up, subtly pick up if these stressors are there. And then we can start applying some therapies to get better. So on that note, Scott, like you mentioned a lot of different supplements. You mentioned antibiotics. So if someone has limes off the bat, or lime, I always pronounce it plural. <laughs> I know, I think everyone does that. They do. I know. I know. I remember every time I'd say limes, you're like, you mean lime? I'm like, yes, lime. At least and you caught yourself because you saved yourself from a correction. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. It's named from Lime, Connecticut, and we can always get into the all the conspiracy theories of it in a later episode. But you talk a lot about these herbs, and I know you really have kind of like your pulses on all of the best herbal companies to – start treating some of these infections. Can you just go over some of the alternatives? Someone comes back with one of these infections. What would be the first couple of things you would do? Well, I mean, I would try to reach out to someone that can uh, provide some of the energetic testing inside. Yeah. But in terms of companies or products or things that I really found helpful and still kind of use, I mean, I'm still doing maintenance treatment. I, I still have things that I want to work on and improve, but, you know, I, I'm, I'm hugely, hugely better. Um, I would say I, I like a company called Supreme Nutrition, which is uh, Michael Leibovitz is a, a yeah, he's great. chiropractor behind that, and the quality of their products are, are wonderful. The cost of their products is very reasonable, and I think um, they've kind of <clears throat> created a whole energetic testing system where they use those products, um, and, and I think that can be really nice if people can access yeah. a practitioner doing that work. Um, I like a company a lot called Beyond Balance. Um, they have glycerin-based uh, mm -hmm. blends that are beautiful that help with, you know, the, the Lyme-related infections, the co-infections, viruses, detoxification, parasites, all of those things. And um, I, I've used them for both my personally I've used them for probably seven plus years now and I think that uh, they're they're very well put together the um, naturopath and herbalist that creates them Susan McCamish um, she created them essentially to get her own 10 year old son out of a wheelchair uh, who for many years was was ill and then they discovered that Lyme was the reason and today he's he's perfectly functional and getting ready to go off off to you know college and and doing fantastically and so that kind of came out of her passion for her own child and has really helped 
helped a number of people. Um, there is a company that I like called Maypa Herbals, M-A-Y-P-A Herbals, and um, that uh, herbalist has some beautiful products. And what's interesting about about those products is I don't often hear people having huge Herxheimer type die-off responses, but I do often hear that people feel better on them. And so there's a, a formula for Lyme and a formula for Bartonella and Babesia and viruses and, and, and Candida type um, organisms. So I think that company is great. A number of people also like the uh, Byron White formulas. Uh, there's some very mm -hmm. pow powerful medicines as yeah, well. Like Byron White. Yeah. Yeah. So those are those are fantastic. But I think it's important, too, for people to not focus just on the microbial issue. Right. I, I think yes. when I started out, my way of thinking about things was that uh, infection was number one toxicity was number two and emotional traumas and conflicts were number three and now you know 20 almost 20 years later i would completely reverse it and say that emotional traumas and conflicts are number one toxicity is number two and infections are number three and it you know it comes back with the infections a lot to the terrain and if we're you know completely toxic with heavy metals and mycotoxins and all these other things um, it's going to be really hard to get the infectious burden to be reduced and Dr. Mm -hmm. Klinghart I have a, an article that Dr. Klinghart and I wrote a few years ago that's also on my website that talks about what he calls the Klinghart axiom which is that you really have to work on the infections toxins and emotional issues kind of simultaneously in order to maintain uh, the progress that you're making if you're only focused on one of them that when you take your eyes away from that, it essentially will kind of go back to a state of equilibrium with the others. And so um, things to support detoxification are, are, are really, really important as well. And what are some things that you recommend for people just to kind of get their emotions and maybe past trauma under control? Like, do you just like uh, things like meditation, mindfulness, maybe tapping techniques to help resolve hidden, um, maybe brainstem kind of, uh, how should I say it's sympathetic responses where people are just locked in this sympathetic response because of past trauma. Right. What kind of things do you recommend that someone could do or techniques that you recommend looking into to help address these unresolved emotional issues? So there are some things that I think are great that need to be somewhat practitioner guided. There's a whole right. system called family constellation uh, therapy that Bert Hellinger created. Dr. Klinghart does a lot of that work and, and it's very interesting and I, I have done family constellation work myself throughout my journey. Uh, you know, for my own kind of recovery. Um, there are systems like applied psychoneurobiology or psychokinesiology, which Dr. Klinghart has created that kind of deal with the emotional work. Uh, EFT, I think, is a good option for people. Any of the tapping systems can be great. Um, there are a couple of specific practitioners that I often refer people to when they're really kind of dealing with the emotional work. Um, Amy Scher is one who uh, had her own journey with Lyme disease. Uh, did stem cells in India many years ago, recovered uh, her, her symptoms completely resolved except for a specific thing she was dealing with, which was endometriosis, which got significantly worse. And so it didn't make sense that everything else had resolved except for this one issue. And so she spent a number of years um, looking into all of these different emotional systems and uh, resolving that eventually by doing the emotional work and now has become a, a beautiful uh, practitioner working with people, uh, you know, every day dealing with trying to help them through some of these emotional challenges. Um, I think that... Uh, there's a system called Evox, which is from the same company that does Zyto that Dr. Cowden uh, mm -hmm. uses a lot for perception repatterning or reframing and kind of um, the way that one works is by taking a voice uh, sample, looking at frequencies that are missing in your voice, and then determining what frequencies the body needs to be given in order to kind of shift that emotional block or emotional stressor. Um, I think some of the Bach flower or bush flower remedies can be mm -hmm. wonderful, some of those tools for helping to support the emotional layer. Um, and then uh, for people that are really more into the, you know, kind of anxiety, what you mentioned, the sympathetic overdrive, um, there's one that I'm just starting to explore. And so I don't have a strong opinion about it yet, but I've gotten some very, very good feedback from two other practitioners um, on this device. It's something called Mind Alive. 
mindalive.com mm -hmm. is their website and it's an audio visual entrainment with uh, cranial electrical stimulation and so you have the the glasses and the headset and you know it has a number of different programs to kind of shift the 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 brain into alpha delta you know different places of deeper relaxation and That's I think great. that, uh, yeah, and it's a fairly inexpensive tool, like, you know, 500 bucks or something. And I think that uh, I, I've used it a couple of times, just got it a week or so ago, and I've used it a couple of times in the last week and found myself kind of conked out, snoring on the couch. <laughs> so it clearly has some uh, usefulness, I think, for kind of calming. There, there's other tools, I think, too, that, you know, can help get people into that kind of parasympathetic state. I mean, I, I like the Biomat, which I know I think we've talked about before yeah. as well. Um, so there's with, a lot with the of biomat that has the amethyst crystals and that has what healing kind of blood flow properties to it. Yeah, it's the amethyst crystals, the far infrared heat and the yeah. negative ions as well. And I mean, I do use it a lot. I mean, no tool is going to solve everybody's problem, but I think that, you know, having some uh, tools that we can kind of bring in and I think kind of creating a, a space or a room or something in your, you know, home that's kind of a, a meditation or a safe sanctuary kind of place where we can, you know, use some of those tools and do some yes. of that work is great. But I do think that, um, you know, the if you didn't have emotional challenges uh, before you got Lyme, most people will have them as a result of the, the journey of going through Lyme and being told that they're, you know, crazy and that their problem is not real and all of these other things. And so um, it is a it is a very difficult um, journey for some people, not everyone, but I think the, the, the people that have had it for, you know, many, many years, um, it, it, it does take a lot of work to get well, but I see it, you know, fairly regularly that people that are doing the right things do get better. I think there's a lot of hope. I think there's so much good information that's coming out now. Stephen Buhner now uh, in the last... Uh, year has come out with two new books on co-infections i mean his yep. work is phenomenal um so i think there's there's many many reasons to be hopeful and i think that um you know lyme disease really is a messenger for many of us i think that the process of going through it really is life-changing and it is certainly probably the biggest challenge that i've ever faced in my life and probably the biggest challenge that many people will face but i also think that you know it's important to look at some of the the beautiful things that come out of it some of the friendships that emerge and some of the insights that people get some of the perspective uh, mm -hmm. some of the the way that you've changed your way of looking at the world um, it kind of forces us to step back and look at what's important and the people in our lives and um, you know it's it, it's a it's a difficult journey and yet so many good things come out of it as well uh, I'm not sure that I would want to kind of snap my fingers and have it go away because I'm a completely different person now coming have it coming through the other side and out the other side of of Lyme disease so right and I want to urge anyone that's listening to this that maybe has a chronic health issue or thinks they have Lyme or a Lyme co-infection to seek out a practitioner like Scott or like myself. Again, Scott is available in the Bay Area, Silicon Valley area for consultation, but you really want to see someone that can help prioritize a program that can look at your diet, look at stress, get everything dialed in so you have a foundation to start addressing some of these infections because it can be very stressful on the body to treat these infections and if you just go out and buy a whole bunch of herbs and throw it inside your body thinking that it's going to fix the problem you may actually even get more sick so just be mindful yeah. of that kind of disclaimer there make sure you're working with someone that can help get the foundation dialed in is there anything yeah. you want to add to that scott you know, I think that um, if someone's dealing with Lyme, reaching out to ILADS, um, ILADS.org mm -hmm. and looking for a doctor there. I, I do do some health coaching work, but I generally um, work in conjunction with a medical doctor that is kind of supervising the overall care. So I right. just want to kind of throw that out there that I'm not, um, you know, not trying to really get too much into the treatment realm. But if someone's working with a doctor and would like some coaching type work, that's something that I could um, certainly potentially help them with as well. That's great, Scott. And how can our listeners here find more about you? I think you said betterhealthguy.com. you got a really big Facebook following too. Can you give everyone your, your stats? Yes, so betterhealthguy.com, so betterhealthguy.com. And on Facebook, facebook.com slash betterhealthguy. Um, the Facebook page tends to be where I post things that I just kind of see every day, articles and interesting things. And then the website, a little bit more, uh, you know, blog and article focus, probably not quite as frequently updated, but there's a lot of stuff 
stuff there that I've collected over the years and articles that I've written and things for, uh, you know, different publications and whatnot that I think will help people as well. Yeah, and I, I'm always referring back to Scott's site for anything Lyme related because there's so much information there. And by the way, Scott, how do you keep up with your Facebook page? It's like every hour there's a new post up there. <laughs> how do you do that? Well, uh, I guess it's good that I'm good at multitasking. Or... <laughs> good answer. <laughs> I like it. So, um, Scott, we're definitely going to have to have you on for a part two because there's so much to dive deep into. You just wrote an article for the Townsend newsletter that should be published any day now. The time everyone listens to this podcast, it'll probably be up, and that's on Bartonella. And I imagine if they just Google Townsend newsletter Bartonella and your name Scott Forsgren they'll probably find that article great article and I love how you finish it the last page or two where you really emphasize looking at the adrenals and the diet and the stress which we kind of emphasize in this call which I like that a lot so take a look at the Bartonella article on the Townsend newsletter and then I want to end this call here Scott because we're going to have you back for a part two okay. later on this year if you would be uh, open sure. to coming back absolutely but I want to end my uh, my calls here with all these last two questions that I'm trying to ask every practitioner or every uh, interviewee here. If you were stuck on a desert island, Scott, and you only could bring one herb or one supplement, what would it be? I would probably say Takasumi Supreme. <laughs> ah, Takasumi Supreme Nutrition. You know, okay. though, with a caveat that if I'm on an island that is not highly toxic, then I may not need it. But yes, uh, in terms true. of being a fantastic toxin binding tool, I found that one to be very, very helpful for me and other people as well. Takasumi Supreme. And for anyone listening, that's like a bamboo wood extract. That's from Michael Leibowitz's company. Uh, great product. Awesome. Yep. And then if you were recommending three things that anyone could do you don't have to have limes but just in general three things that anyone could do to help improve their health what would those three things be um, I would say reducing stress um, it's a much bigger factor than I think we realize and something that I still have to consciously work on every day to you know focus on especially when it comes to the effects of adrenals and whatnot on overall health so reducing stress um, Improving the diet, uh, so reducing, uh, not really reducing, but eliminating gluten, dairy, reducing sugar, um, anything that you're known to be allergic to, reducing mm -hmm. pesticide exposure, you know, uh, I think that's really, really important. And then I would probably say making sure that the environment that you're living in is safe for your health and or recovery from a perspective of either mold exposure or ongoing electromagnetic field exposure, which may seem uh, like not such a big deal, but when you really look at the impacts on electromagnetic fields and cell phones and cordless phones and wireless internet and all these things on health, it's often a factor that uh, once uh, reduced or removed that people's health uh, often takes a, a positive forward step. Yeah, and you really, your story is very similar to Dave Asprey's story with the whole mold toxicity. So it's, it's yeah. interesting how these common threads happen with these chronic uh, disease situations. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, thanks so much, Scott. Is there any last bit of information you want to share with the listeners, websites, anything else? Sure. I'll mention um, one foundation. I know a lot of times uh, people that are dealing with Lyme disease, uh, it's a financial struggle. Um, mm -hmm. They've spent a lot of money. And so one foundation that I work with, I'm on the board of a foundation called Limelight Foundation. And the website for that is limelightfoundation.org. And the purpose of that foundation is to support treatment for uh, children and young adults 25 and under and so um, we provide financial assistance for people that can't otherwise access care and it's been such a positive uh, experience for me to be involved in you know seeing the things that happen when people's lives you know change and improve because they're able to access care and so if anybody is um, either in a position where they have uh, a family member or themselves that are you know, 25 and under and need access to care and financially can't get that then uh, looking at limelightfoundation.org may be helpful or if this resonates with someone and they're interested in, in talking with the foundation about uh, providing support or financial support uh, to continue our mission um, that would be great as well so I think that would be a, a good resource for people limelightfoundation.org Awesome, thanks so much Scott we appreciate you coming on the show Thank you Dr. Justin, be well, thanks Thank you 
Got a question for Dr. J? Go to beyondwellnessradio.com forward slash question. Then tune in to hear the answer. Also, if you like the show, review us on iTunes. For more Beyond Wellness Radio, go to beyondwellnessradio.com.